we don't have a whole lot of messages in this church on heaven or the afterlife. I suppose that's because we're very busy living the Christian life on earth. But tonight's going to be different. How many of you know what the title is going to be? It's on the tape list. Some of you have seen it already on the tape list, it looks like. Chapter 31. Chapter 31. Which, by the way, after a year now is the last chapter. This is the last chapter of the book. And then next week, we'll look at the little postscript, which is the banquet, chapter 31, which we've entitled, Lifted Veils and Untinted Glass. Lifted Veils and Untinted Glass. You see, Christian people have a goal that they're headed toward which gives meaning to life then. Amen. They're not just living randomly like the world is out there, which, which causes life to be rather boring and, well, purposeless. It doesn't really have any meaning or purpose because the people don't have a goal. But Christians have a goal. Sometimes in the struggle to live effectively and efficiently the Christian life on the earth, we might forget about or lose sight of the goal, but we really shouldn't. The Bible has a lot to say about the return of the Lord Jesus in the Bible. That's in the New Testament, and the Bible has a lot to say about the afterlife and heaven. Now, maybe not just a whole lot of specifics, but I think we have enough. We have enough so that I've got several volumes in my library, big, thick volumes on the afterlife. So there must be something in the Bible or somebody is making up things about the afterlife. Perhaps the specific details are left out so we can enjoy the surprise of it all. But a lot has already been shown to us in the Word of God. I think I've said before that one of the first messages I ever preached, long before I ever knew anyone here, was on the Second Advent because it didn't seem like a lot of people were preaching about that or living as though uh, it was an historic event that is going to take place very shortly. And... If I can say this in all modesty, it's one thing that has kept me going over the years. And in those early days, it was my kind of mainstay, my security blanket, just to think that it's worth it all. Amen. It's worth it all. I had all these friends around me who came into this and then fell away for the most trivial reasons. You know, for cars or for wives or for it's just too hard or too difficult. And I think, so trivial, so trivial. None of us have been beaten for the faith. I mean, that hasn't caused us to apostatize or we've lost loved ones or our children have been murdered by the communist or something. So, so trivial, it's worth it all. There's an end in sight here. There's a goal that we're headed toward. And not a, enough people, I don't think, think about the matter. And there's certainly not enough teaching about the matter. A lot about what to do in this life, and that's good. And that's where the balance of the teaching should be because... If you're not any good in this life, you won't make it into the next, so you don't need to worry about the next. You've got to do something about your life now. But in the process of living the Christian life now, uh, we have to remind ourselves that there is a fixed end to it all, which is the return of the Lord Jesus and the afterlife. So perhaps you can see what I mean by the title that I've given it, Lifted Veils and Untinted Glass. We'll look at some portions of Scripture after we have read along a little here. But there are customs, for instance, in countries, I guess there's a custom even in this country, in marriage where the bride wears a veil until the conclusion of the ceremony and the union has been pronounced by the minister, since that's generally where it happens, and then the veil is lifted. Now that goes way back into oh, several millennia of history because it was to symbolize the end of one life and the start of another. Or to say it another way, when two-ness becomes oneness at that time. And you find that in the Old Testament. So that you can look through the veil and you can see something, and the people behind the veil can see out of it, but not clearly. That's the whole point, not clearly. It's a type, it's a symbol. And untinted glass, well, that's the same thing as we will see here in a moment. So let's start into chapter 31 and get reading a little bit. 
my dear, my very dear wormwood, my poppet, my pig sneeze. How mistakenly, now that all is lost. Now, I realize I didn't complete that sentence, but we're alerted immediately to something different about this chapter by, number one, the unusually long salutation. Generally, it's been, my dear wormwood. And number two, by this phrase, which already tells it all, all is lost. So we have to kind of stop there to think for a moment something's going to be different about this chapter and we already know it's the last so something should be different about it it's the conclusion of the story when compared with every other chapter here in the book it's always been my dear wormwood signed your affectionate uncle Screwtape. you'll see that the conclusion is different as well so we've got an unusually long salutation my dear my very dear wormwood my poppet my pixney those are British terms just meaning like my dear, my dear one. How mistakenly, now that all is lost. Now, if you haven't read ahead, most of you haven't, I'm sure, then you don't know exactly what we're going to see here, but something has happened so that all is lost. The game is over with. Although I'm sure a lot of you have already guessed if you haven't read ahead. You come whimpering to ask me whether the terms of affection in which I address you meant nothing from the beginning. Far from it. Rest assured, my love for you and your love for me are as like as two peas. You've heard that, two peas in the same pea pod. I have always desired you as you, pitiful fool, desired me. The difference is that I am the stronger. I think they will give you to me now, or a bit of you. Love you? Why, yes, as dainty a morsel as ever I grew fat on. In other words, what's going to happen here is that ineffective and unsuccessful lower echelon tempters are given as some type of spiritual food. Now, this is his own, C.S. Lewis's own reasoning here, but given as some type of spiritual food to those higher up below. Remember, the last chapter is about the banquet, although that concerns other things, human beings as well. You have let a soul slip through your fingers. Well, we know he let him slip at the very beginning of the book in conversion but he's been trying to unconvert him all along. And evidently, it's not been successful. The howl of sharpened famine for that loss re-echoes at this moment through all the levels of the kingdom of noise down to the very throne itself. It makes me mad to think of it, how well I know what happened at the instant when they snatched him from you. There was a sudden clearing of his eyes, was there not? as he saw you for the first time and recognized the part you had had in him and knew that you had it no longer. Just think and let it be the beginning of your agony that he felt that what he felt at that moment as if a scab had fallen from an old sore, as if he were emerging from a hideous shell-like tetter, a skin disease, as if he shuffled off for good and all a defiled, wet, clinging garment. By H, I guess that's his profanity, living there, he ought to be accustomed to that. It is misery enough to see them in their mortal days taking off dirtied and uncomfortable clothes and splashing in hot water and giving little grunts of pleasure, stretching their eased limbs. What then of this final stripping, this complete cleansing? The more one thinks about it, the worse it becomes. He got through so easily. No gradual misgivings, no doctor's sentence, no nursing home, no operating theater, no false hopes of life, sheer instantaneous liberation. One moment it seemed to be all our world, the scream of bombs, the fall of houses, the stink and taste of high explosive on the lips and in the lungs, the feet burning with weariness, the heart cold with horrors, the brain reeling, the legs aching. Next moment... All this was gone, gone like a bad dream, never again to be of any account. Defeated, outmaneuvered fool. Did you mark how naturally, as if he had been born for it, the earth-born vermin entered the new life? Have you caught what happened to the man thus far? He was bombed into smithereens. So that ended the devil trying to tempt him any longer in his life. He just went immediately above. And that's what screw tape is so concerned about now. We've lost him. You fool, you bumbling idiot, you outmaneuvered fool. 
how all his doubts became in the twinkling of an eye, ridiculous, all the times that he had struggled with something on the earth. Because the only reason that we struggle, I mean, let's face reality, is because of the presence of evil all around us. They're the ones that try to confuse the matter. Whenever you are in heaven with God, well, there's no confusion anymore. And you look back on all those little times that you doubted or that you struggled or that you tripped and fell, and you say, how stupid, how ridiculous. It was so easy. All I had to do was trust and obey. Amen. Just have faith and do the will of God. Trust yeah. and obey, as the song said. But it's an, it's an evil world, and there are demons around, and that's what this book is about. I know what the creature was saying to itself. Yes, of course. It always was like this. All horrors have followed the same course, getting worse and worse and forcing you into a kind of bottleneck till at the very moment when you thought you must be crushed, behold, you were out of the narrows and all was suddenly well. The extraction hurt more and more, and then the tooth was out. The dream became a nightmare, then you awoke. You die and die, and then you are beyond death. How could I have ever doubted it? As he saw you, this is really his first point, as he saw you so far. He's going to go on to two more here in this chapter. And with the point being that at death or the rapture, whenever that transformation happens, then a lot's going to happen along with that. And I think for the first time, although we know fully well that demons are alive and well and active on planet Earth, there will be a new type of realization of who and what was the source of all adversity and sickness, all temptation and evil, all trial, all divorce, all calamity, all poverty, everything that's wrong with the world today. Galatians 1.4, this present evil age, that there'll be a new realization. Oh, I see. I knew it. I knew it, but now I see it though. There's a difference in knowing something and seeing it. Now I can see. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my wife's fault. It wasn't my children's fault. It wasn't my parents' fault. It wasn't my employer's fault. It wasn't anybody's fault but the devil's. That's right. He was the one behind everything. That's what he's saying. As he saw you, that's the first revelation that he gets. Instantaneously, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in the splitting of an atom, is what the Greek said in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. At that instant of time, then all of this becomes reality to him. Before, it was something that was grasped and possessed by faith, knowledge that was possessed by faith, and now it's realized, it's actualized. So there's the first point, and we don't want to go over that too quickly, but we do want to get to the rest of the chapter, that it will be a blessing to see, and we already know, if we know the Word and we've been trained and taught in the Word, we know the source of sickness and adversity we, all we have to do is read Acts 10.38 or Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4 or 1 John chapter 5 verses 18 and 19 or the temptations that Jesus received from the hands of the devil in Luke 4. What did the devil tell him? I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world because they are given to me and to whomsoever I will I give them. Or if you want it in a shortened form, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's the God of this age. Amen. He's the God of this world. Now, you think about that. He is the one who causes everything to go wrong. That's right. You wouldn't have problems. You wouldn't have marital problems. You wouldn't have headaches or toe aches or any type of aches without the devil being in control. So the first thing that we will actually see and know is him and those with him. So there's one. As he saw you, and here's the second thing, he also saw them. Now, he's talking about the angels. And Lewis, with his um, sub-Christian view, may even have thrown in human beings here. Remember Lewis, he's not orthodox. By far, Lewis is not an orthodox Christian. And he believed in praying to the dead and that the dead could help the saints alive and, you know, stupid Roman Catholic notions because he was Catholic, although it wasn't Roman. It was Anglo-Catholicism, as it's sometimes called. But we know that, that the saints above don't help the saints below. That's not scripture. And we can't pray to them, and they're not praying for us. But we have been given. You see, I think what a lot of the um, deceived religious people have done is they've taken a, a passage like the 11th and 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews and have made something out of that that's not there. 
Well, what is there is the fact that God has left on record in Holy Writ the story of a multitude of saints before us who are, as it were, witnesses above. Not that they're up there praying for us or saying, now, now I'm going to send my personal angel down to help, you know, little Tom over there get out of his problems. That's not why they're there, but they're there for us to look at in Scripture and realize that they saw it all the way to the end. They have gone on a path before us, and the path is ready for us to follow behind them. That's about the cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12.1. Anyway, clouds don't look down. People look up at clouds. Clouds are the things looking down. Uh, the cloud of witnesses. They're not, as it's often portrayed, I think, you know, the ones sitting in the stands beholding or witnessing what's going on out on the field. If they're a cloud, well, we know what clouds are. They're up in the sky and people look up at them. So the point there in Hebrews 11 and 12 is for us to look at them. And that's what we're told over and over again in Hebrews 11. It's to look at them, behold these people. And then after he gets through with all of those saints of old, remember that he finally ends in chapter 12 by saying, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. And then gives his story, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 12:3 and follow. I know how it was when he saw them. <clears throat> and what else I think is included here? And he's probably right. Well, I don't know. I mean, and Lewis doesn't know either. Whether the demons somehow follow the people into heaven or to the boundaries of heaven or whatever. We are told, though, in the book of Job that the devil had and probably still has access right to the throne of God. Remember, the sons of God came and presented themselves before the throne and God looked at the devil, Satan, he's called there, and said, what have you been doing, Satan? And he said what Peter said that he does over in 1 Peter 5. Well, I've been walking up and down through the earth. And then Peter finishes it, seeking whom he may devour. He just said, I've been walking up and down. Peter said, that's right, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So it may be that the demons have some type of contact with heaven. I certainly wouldn't rule that out. I don't know any scripture that would rule that out. I know how it was. You reeled back, dizzy and blinded, more hurt by them than he had ever been by bombs. The degradation of it, that this thing of earth, slime, could stand upright and converse with spirits before whom you, a spirit, could only cower. Seeing our earthly <clears throat> tied to the globe existence here, well, we believe in angels, we know that they're there, but they are there. They're not just phantoms or something. They have personality. They have minds. They can talk. They have memory. You're going to see them one day and be able to talk to them. They're not just like, well, when you start your car up on a cold morning, that smoke that you see behind your car, that's not what they're like. That this thing of earth and slime could stand upright and converse with spirit before whom you, a spirit, could only cower. I mean, the, the irony of it all, that a human being could converse with pure spirit and that this spirit, this demon, could only cower. Perhaps you would hope that the awe and strangeness of it would dash his joy. But <clears throat> that is the cursed thing. The gods are strange to mortal eyes, and yet they are not strange. He had no faintest conception till that very hour of how they would look and even doubted their existence. But when he saw them, he knew that he had always known them and realized what part each of them had played at many an hour in his life when he had supposed himself alone, so that now he could say to them one by one, not, who are you, but, so it was you all the time. That's part of the mystery of it all. You'll say, oh, you were the one that kept me from injury that time, or you were the one that protected my child when they fell down the stairs that day. Not, who are you, like, I've never seen you before. It's just an immediate knowing. I doubt there'll be a lot of introductions. Now, this is angel number one trillion here. After you've gone through a trillion of them, you'll know. you just know. Not, who are you, but, so it was you all the time. Now, it'll probably be a little low angel, you know, that you meet. Not Michael or Gable. They have important functions and features up there. But there's an innumerable company of other types of creatures up there. Many different angels. That's really a blessing to think of that, that they are real. 
that don't get from this as Lewis kind of does, you know, as Roman Catholics do. Well, I get so warm and such loving thoughts in my heart for the angel, I think I'll pray to one tonight. Because, or talk to him as my old buddy or something. No, we only reach heaven and the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. And the angels are our servants and our ministers, and they are gods as well. But we don't talk to each other right now. <laughs> we just thank Jesus for them. Because before you know it, you're into spiritualism then. You're talking to spirits in an unauthorized way. And you're talking, and just the very fact that you're talking to them is in itself unauthorized. So we won't be asking, who are you, but we'll be stating, oh, so it was you all the time. All that they were and said at this meeting woke memories, the dim consciousness of friends about him, which had haunted his solitudes from infancy, was now at last explained. There he is into the saints, you know, somehow around us. That central music in every pure experience, which had always just evaded memory, was now at last recovered. Recognition made him free of their company almost before the limbs of his corpse became quiet. Only you were left outside. Remember what's happened to the man. He's been blown to smithereens in the bomb shelters there. All the bombs came falling in the bombing of Britain. He's blown to smithereens and probably a whole lot of other people as well. Maybe a lot of the others not saved. This man is. And so it's instantaneous, immediate uh, deliverance from this world. And, uh, catching up above. Now, before we read any further, what we might also include here, which is another blessing, will be the reunion of the saints above, because there certainly will be that. Let's just take a look at a few passages here. Now, you've probably heard people say something along this line. This is a popular little saying, and how true it really is, that we might as well learn to love each other now. You know the rest of that. Because we'll be together for a long, long time. But how true that is. Uh, let me just mention this verse because it really speaks about the Lord and the person. And we'll look at it later. But 1 Corinthians 13, 12b reads as follows. Then shall I know, even as also I am known. 1 Corinthians 13, 12b. But then if you'll turn with me over to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, and then we'll look at a passage over in Hebrews 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. There's no way that I can open your mind or your spirit and make these things real to you. You'll just have to ask the Lord to make them real to you and meditate on them. But I, I think about this oftentimes, not only of the years that we are privileged to spend with each other now, of all the other human beings in the world, the billions on the globe that God has brought us together to spend a long, long time together now, in the here and the now. And as I've often said, and I don't mean by these statements any type of, you know, anti-Second Advent meaning or something, but the thought of growing old together is a very comforting thought. It should be to a Christian to think that we can stay together and love each other and live together for a long, long time and not be married and live together for a long time. You know, if you're married, you have to. You're stuck. But otherwise, you you know, you've got the choice. You can pick up and leave. And you don't find a group of people that come together and stay together for a long time. But, of course, you know, I'm willing for it not to be a long time. If the Lord wants to come back next week, the sooner the better. So I never meant by that statement an anti-Second Advent type of meaning. I meant a very positive meaning of Christian love. They'll know that we are his disciples by the love that we have for one another. And so I sometimes, I'm driving along thinking, now what's it going to be like? This happens to me a lot. And you need to become a mystic or visionary if it doesn't happen to you. What's it going to be like when, um, you know, sister so-and-so in the church, who's, you know, 20 or 25 or whatever now, when, yes, when she's over the hill, <laughs> when she's 55, and we've known her almost all of her life over the hill and started down on the good slide into eternity. Amen. Hallelujah. When, you know, she has gray hair. Now it's pretty. It's, you know, brown or black or blonde or red. and It'll be gray then. She has gray hair. Or what about these children? You know, when you knew them, you changed their diapers or helped bring them into this world. And you know them when they're 40 or 50 years old. So I think of that, and then I think of this. You know, we have these little struggles and cat fights and things back and forth that 
happen in the church every now and then. And one day it's just going to be boom and we're going to all be above. And we're going to get to look back and talk about this world and our life and what God has done and the glories of heaven that we're experiencing right then. <laughs> I drive around thinking of that sometimes. What a blessing that will be. You know, then you don't want to become anti-people here. Get into problems and fights with people here. You don't even want to go through that and have your record blemished in any way. You have to look back on that with regret or remorse. As I started off saying, at the, in the end, it'll be worth it all. The little time that you can just forget about it and not make a big deal about the matter, it'll take care of itself anyway. And I'm not saying, you know, don't practice Matthew 18 if it has to be practiced, but, you know, in the long run, you hate to have a lot of problems to have to look back on and say, well, yeah, I remember when we fought that day, and, yep, that was a bad six months. We were at each other's throat all the time. That won't be a very good memory. Maybe he'll wipe those away, but it won't be a good memory. It's not a good memory now. First Thessalonians 4.13 but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, this is not soul sleep, as the cult teach. Sleep, obviously, it's been in ancient history, and it is in the Word of God a metaphor for death. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. In other words, he said, I don't want you sorrowing. It's all right to sorrow at the passing of a Christian friend or a loved one especially if it's a saved loved one. It's all right to be sorry. Jesus wept and the saints wept over the death of members of the body, but not the um, profound type of weeping and sorrow that's carried on by the world, where you actually go through stages of recovery to get over the death of your husband or something. Um, what that shows is the conclusion of this verse that neither you nor him, if he's the one, neither of the two of you have any hope. If there's hope, there's nothing to be sorry about. Amen. The only one to be sorry for is yourself anyway. Yeah, they're not missing out on anything if they're above. You're just missing out on their company. So you should be crying for yourself, not them. But how many times the denominational ministers preach someone who's as pagan as Al Capone right into the kingdom by reading <laughs> Psalm 23 over the casket or something? <laughs> Typical denominational ministers can preach anyone into heaven. Well, we know this man might have had his faults, but God understands, you know. God understands. Yes, God does understand. And so does the devil. It's too bad that minister doesn't understand. So he doesn't want us to sorrow without hope, because we do have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, everything is based on him. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, now do we all believe that? Amen. Oh, amen, we do. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The old and the young he'll bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now, this is a direct revelation, Paul got. <clears throat> this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This isn't his opinion. Once he said over in 1 Corinthians 7, I don't have any word from the Lord on this, but this is what I have to say. We could explain that. That probably doesn't mean what most of you think it does. Let me just say that so you won't think I contradict myself later on. <clears throat> and in the end of that chapter, Paul goes on to give advice to a woman who has lost her husband, and he said, I think that you ought to just go ahead and remain unmarried the rest of your life. He said, this is what I think, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. He's saying, I think this is what the Lord would have me say to you. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now that is their body. Their spirit is already with God. Today, Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise to the thief on the cross. Amen. And he didn't say, verily, verily, I say unto thee, today, you'll be with me in paradise sometime, I don't know when because all of his verily, verily statements end there, and then whatever words have to go with the second part. Today has to go with, today you'll be with me in paradise. The JDS people try to use that and say, well, he said, verily, verily, I say unto thee today, you'll be with me, but he didn't say he'd be with him today. He's just saying, I'm saying this to you today. Well, any fool would know that. If you're talking and you're alive, you know that what he said is said now, today, that he didn't say it yesterday or next year sometime. What a fool, the JDS heretic. 
But anyway, if you just study, you know, the gospel writings, all those statements where he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, and then there's always has to be a comma after that. You can't throw any, you know, move over the todays or the other words and put it back with the verily, verily. The verily, verily, I say unto you is the statement itself. And what does he say? Here it is. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Never except that one time did the JDS people try to remove one of those words from that second portion and put it over with the first. It's a mystery to me. <laughs> For the dead in Christ will rise first. So what I was saying is that their spirits are with God, but their bodies will be raised, and the spirit and the body, and the body will be changed, of course. You can't raise up an old thing that's been dead for, you know, 500 or 1,000 years and expect to get too much out of it, except something to put in a haunted house on Halloween. But it will be changed and reunited with the spirit, and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them. Now, there's a lot in this passage, and I think what we have intimated with this little phrase here, together with them, is some type of union. Now, I know that the meeting of the Lord is the uh, primary union spoken of here, but if there's no other type of union, why doesn't he just lift the dead up first, the bodies, and get them into heaven, and then lift the living up, change them and lift them up, and then do whatever he's going to do. Why is it that he lifts up one, lifts up the other, they come together, and then together they meet the Lord in the air? There's some type of personal union spoken of here between believers, the dead and the living believers, some type of personal union here. There'll be recognition of dead loved ones, dead Christians, and so forth that are in Christ. Now, the others aren't raised. We're told over in Revelation 20, they're not raised until after the millennium, so that they're then raised, and then they are reunited with their spirit, and they're thrown into the lake of fire, which burneth forever and ever. So this is something that comes before that. That's known as the great white throne judgment, the end of the millennium in Revelation 20. Then which we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That means wherever he goes, we'll go. Now, he doesn't say he comes to earth in this passage. It very clearly says that we'll meet him in the clouds. And then it doesn't go on to say, and then he comes on to the earth after that. You don't find a reference to that here at all. And, of course, what the rest of the scriptures will show is that, no, he doesn't come to the earth, because this is the rapture that precedes the tribulation period. And then after the tribulation, the Lord returns to the earth, which you have to go to other scriptures to find that. So shall we ever be. So wherever he is, we'll be. When he stays in heaven, we'll stay there. When he comes to the earth at the end of the tribulation period, we'll come with him. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. That means there's some measure of comfort in this. Well, I think it's comforting to know that we're going to meet the Lord, that we're going to be with the Lord, that if we are alive, our bodies are going to be changed. If we are dead, we're going to be raised and our bodies changed. Whether living or dead, we're going to meet the opposite party. If we're living, we'll meet the dead. If we're dead, we'll meet the living because we'll all be alive on that day. There's a lot of comfort in this, a whole lot of comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. To know that you'll see dead saints. I mean, dead saints. I mean, dead saints, that includes people like the Apostle Paul. He's been dead for 2,000 years, as well as people that have might maybe have died in recent times. That goes back a long, long time for dead saints. I mean, there's going to be a small number of living people compared to the dead that go up. No wonder the dead are raised first. There's a lot to raise. You you get the big section out of the way first of all. Think of the thousands of people who are considered saints. Old Testament, you've got to go way back to Adam in the garden. His dust is somewhere. I don't know if you could find it, but it's somewhere. God will find it, that's for sure. He knows where it is. It's been all mixed up in the flood. It may be way down there where the geologists are always studying. They should have brought it up with them whenever they came up with those dinosaur bones. But God knows where it is. He'll get all of that together. And the saints of the first century of the early church, and the martyrs through history, and then, you know, people that have died as, you know, as recent as two minutes ago. Two minutes prior to when all of this takes place here, I'm sure someone will have died then. Then God will have to raise them up, first of all, and then the living. And then if you'll jump over into Hebrews chapter 12. See, 
See, when we study like this, what it kind of will do for you is show you how everything is worth it all in the long run. You can't study this every day because we're just talking about things that we can't do anything about. And there's no calling on our life to discipline or anything, just studying about heaven. Well, it's going to happen one day. The rapture will happen. Nothing I can do about it. So that's not what the Bible says to study and teach and exhort and admonish about all the time because you can't do anything about that. That's all in God's hands. We've got to be prepared for that whenever it does happen. Amen. So we have to study both, but the balance of it has to be in the overcoming Christian life. And then with the extra time or when you get to the end of books like Screw Tape Letters and you can study a little about the afterlife. Hebrews 12, uh, let's start with verse 18. Hebrews 12, 18. Fear not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. That's old Mount Sinai, which we're told was altogether on a smoke, as the King James says, altogether on a smoke, Exodus 19. The sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. That's in Exodus 20, after the giving of the ten words, the ten commandments. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much, now he's quoting from the Old Testament, as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned. That last phrase is bad text in the KJV, or thrust through with the dark. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So he said, you haven't come to that, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the Presbyterian... Oh, no, sorry about that. <laughs> to, <laughs> no, that... What a contrast. Here's the General Assembly, not the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, but that's what we have. That was our great governing body, was the General Assembly of PCUSA. To the General Assembly, period, not of the Presbyterian Church, and the Church of the Firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the Judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And we won't read any past that. We'll get to that here in a moment. Now look at this list of things, the whole study in itself unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, that's New Jerusalem. That's New Jerusalem. One of our sisters needs to get a song about New Jerusalem so we can always be happy in our trials. Revelation 21, 22. And to an innumerable company of angels, innumerable company, myriads and myriads, the Greek says in Revelation 5, King James says thousands and thousands and tens of thousands. I guess innumerable is a good word. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Now, he's gone from the angelic company to the human company of redeemed men. To the general assembly <laughs> and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. There's another picture. We don't have a lot, but there's another picture of what we have to look forward to in the afterlife. Meeting these people that we have read about. Uh, of course, you could flip back and look at Hebrews 11. Look at all of those people there. Now, maybe some of them you wouldn't want to meet, you know, because they did some bad things here and there, but... Most of them you would. Like Abraham, surely you'd want to meet Abraham. Or Abel, murdered by his own brother. Or Enoch. Or Moses. Or David. Or the prophet. See, he goes through that whole list. Verse 39, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And here's that verse I kept alluding to earlier, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And what he has reference to there are the witnesses of Hebrews 11. But you see, he's written Hebrews 11, that is the cloud. We look to that. We don't pray to these people, but we look to the example they've set before us, which Hebrews 11 says was, over and over it says, was an example of faith. And then he finally 
says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. So he goes through that list to end with the Lord himself. Well, let's jump back into the screw tape letters again. So much for that part. We'll recognize the demons to be those who tried to foil us on earth. We'll recognize the angels. We'll recognize the saints. Page 148, top of the page, beginning of that paragraph. He saw not only them, and this is the story of redemption, he saw him. This animal, this thing begotten in a bed, could look on him. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him. It's clarity itself and wears the form of a man. Remember in Daniel 11, you get any chills on your spine when you read this? Remember in Daniel 7, 13, he, Daniel said, I beheld in the visions of the night and one who looked as though he were the son of man. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him. It's clarity itself. And where's the form of a man? Well, Lewis's orthodox in his theology here, Jesus didn't then, after he went back to the right hand of the Father, assume some pre-incarnate state. That would be impossible. That would be asking for the impossible. No, he didn't go back and assume what he was in his pre-incarnate state, but in his glorified incarnate state, which makes him wear the form of a man. Now, he doesn't mean wear the form as though it were disguised and he's really not a man. But he is, we're told in Philippians 2, that he was made in the form or in the fashion of a man. And he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and God has exalted him. You would like, if you could, to interpret the patient's prostration in the presence, his self-abhorrence and utter knowledge of his sins. Yes, Wormwood, a clearer knowledge even than yours on the analogy of your own choking and paralyzing sensations when you encounter the deadly air that breathes from the heart of heaven. But it's all nonsense. Pains he may still have to encounter, but they embrace those pains. They would not barter them for any earthly pleasure. All the delights of sense or heart or intellect with which you could once have tempted him even the delights of virtue itself now seem to him in comparison, but as the half-nauseous attractions of a rattled harlot would seem to a man who hears that his true beloved, whom he has loved all his life, and whom he had believed to be dead, is alive, and even now at his door. He is caught up into that world where pain and pleasure take on transfinite values, and where all our arithmetic is dismayed. Once more, the inexplicable meets us. Next to the curse of useless tempters like yourself, the greatest curse upon us is the failure of our intelligence department. If we could only find out what he is really up to. We know what he's up to. <laughs> Redeeming men and defeating the devil. But they don't believe that. They don't believe that God can love because love is self-sacrificial. They think it's some front for something else that he's up to. Alas, alas, that knowledge in itself so hateful and mawkish a thing should yet be necessary for power. Sometimes I am almost in despair. All that sustains me is the conviction that our realism, our rejection in the face of all temptations, of all silly nonsense and claptrap such as nonsense about love, must win in the end. Meanwhile, I have to settle with you. Most truly do I sign myself your increasingly and ravenously affectionate uncle, Screwtape. And we see the next thing we have to behold, Screwtape proposes a toast at the bank. Well, that will be next week. So after he's dealt with the spiritual beings, the demons and the angels, the reunion of the saints above, he finally comes to meeting Jesus Christ himself. <coughs> Flip over with me to 2 Corinthians 3, if you will, and let's just take a quick look at a couple of these passages that served as the basis 
for the title to our study, Lifted Veils, in the first place, and Untented Glass. What it speaks of is our being rescued from life here in the body and in the flesh, not as though we feel that our soul is somehow imprisoned in the body, the old Greek view, and splitting man up. The body God has redeemed himself, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, therefore glorify God with your body. But we know that we don't see things as clearly, even with all of the knowledge and light from the word of God, we cannot, we do not, we cannot see things as we shall see them. In 2 Corinthians 3, you have perhaps one of the, in my notebook, most beautiful chapters in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians is a favorite book of mine, as I think I've said before. I've got my favorites that maybe some people...